Yesterday we were driving and Matthew was in the back and uh, he was saying he's, he's, he's got a big problem. So I said, what's, what's your problem? He says, no man, I'm getting thin. And um, my clothes are not fitting me anymore, so I have to take it to the tailors and they're charging me more than what I paid for this stuff to alter it. And I said, Matthew, you know what? We all got problems. And my problem is my clothes is getting too small and it's not fitting me. So church, this morning, I want to let you know that irrespective of who you are, it doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter how spiritual you might, you might be. It doesn't matter whether you're from Mitchell's Plain or Durbanville. It doesn't matter um, if you're from Cape Town or Durban. It doesn't matter the color of your skin or the gender. We all will experience problems in our lives. We all will experience problems in our lives. The um, title of my message this morning is, We All Have Problems. I'm sure you don't do this. You wake up in the morning, mm, problems, why don't you come to me? <laughs> problems, I wish I had more problems. I wish I got more problems today than yesterday. Nobody wishes for problems. In fact, we want to stay away from the problems. We want to get away from the issues of life. But somehow it seems that, that, pro uh, that the problem comes to you. It comes looking for you. Yeah. Right? I, I, I know that. I'm quiet, I'm minding my own business. Everything is going fine and all of a sudden something goes wrong. I didn't ask for it, but that is life. And if you have not experienced any problems in your life, I want to tell you today, you will experience a problem. If you're young and you say, no, I've got no issues, no problem. It will come. It must come. We all are going to have issues. We all are going to have problems in our lives. Now this morning, um, I'm going to take my reading from uh, the book of Isaiah chapter 61. Okay, Isaiah chapter 61 from the top. Now, before we even read this, I just want to give you a background of what's happening here. So Isaiah is a prophet and he was set in place to prophesy to the people of God, right? To prophesy over them because they had problems. They had issues. They were going through a rough time. So Isaiah, he um, prophesied over them in Isaiah 61. But the amazing thing is that this happened 700 years. This happened 700 years before Jesus was born. And now when Jesus was around, he went into the temple and he started to minister in the temple. And um, there was no Bible. They had scrolls. And Jesus picked up a scroll and he opened it up to Isaiah 61. So in Isaiah 61, we see this. And then you find the same thing in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 4. You find the exact same thing. Jesus is reading the same thing. But what is the difference here? So what is interesting about this portion of scripture is that it was a prophecy done 700 years before Jesus. But in the book of Luke chapter 4, Jesus went into the temple, picked up the scrolls, he read, he read the exact same scripture, Isaiah 61, and he tells the people there on that day that this prophecy has now, has today been fulfilled as the prophecy was in fact about Jesus Christ. So let's read it, right? Let's see what it is says. What does it say? And Jesus reads this now, right? In, in the book of Luke, this is what Jesus is reading. And he reads, start from verse 1. Guys, do you have it? 61. From verse 1, and Jesus reads, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. So now Jesus is reading this, but he's reading about himself. The prophecy is being fulfilled. Here we see, by this reading, we see that God has anointed Jesus. And what was the purpose? What was the purpose that Jesus was anointed? What is the purpose that Jesus came here? Let's read the second one, the second part to preach good tidings to the poor. Jesus had an assignment and he had to bring the good news of salvation to those who were without the comforts of life, to the poor. He had to tell the poor people who didn't have much about the good news of salvation that he brings. Now, not only did he have to share the good news, but next he says, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Jesus came to heal our brokenness. Now, how, how do we get broken hearts? Teenagers, and let me start with you. 
how would you get a broken heart? Hey, Jaden, seems like you know what I'm talking about. How would you get a broken heart? Relationships. And that's the only way broken hearts come about. Relationships. So it can be in any type of relationship. Um, boyfriend, girlfriend, um, between a father and a son, any type of relationship, you can get a broken heart. You can be disappointed. And sometimes, church, you know, we, we feel that our hearts are broken in a million pieces. How many of you felt that? You went through something and you felt that your heart is broken in a million pieces and there's just nobody that can put this together because it's, it's shattered. Our hearts are shattered because of the relationship problems that we have. But this morning I'm here to tell you about a specialist. A specialist that doesn't matter how many pieces your heart is in. He will operate your heart and he will put it back together piece by piece. He came to heal the broken hearted. That is what Jesus came for. We read again. He came to proclaim liberty to the captives. What does this mean? It means he came to bring freedom to the people who are held captive by sin and by their habits. How many of us here were held captive by sin and our bad habits? One, two, five? Oh, the rest of you guys are perfect. Well, those of you that didn't raise your hand, let me wake you up this morning and tell you that Jesus wouldn't have come if we were sinless. Why would he come to die on the cross if we were sinless? Each and every one of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory. Look at somebody next to you and say, we have all fallen short. We've sinned. So each and every one of us have had a habit, have had some sort of sin in our lives. And after you confess your sin, it doesn't make you perfect. Because it's a continual process. Every day you wake up, you ask for forgiveness. Because sometimes you might not even know that you're sinning. But we sin. That's our nature. We have a sinful nature. Jesus came to proclaim liberty to the captives. He, he came to release us from, from the, the sin what was, what had held us captive. We couldn't move. We were bound in sin. But Jesus came to break it. He came to break the hold of sin. Came to proclaim liberty to the captives. Let's read further. Jesus came for the opening of prisons to those who are bound. Being bound. What does it mean to be bound? Bound means to be joined or tied to something that you cannot break free of. You cannot break free from. When you pull in one direction, it just holds you and you just cannot move. It is a struggle. It is a battle. You can't set yourself free from this battle. You are bound, you're fighting the battle, and when you when you sing, hey, I am I am I am winning, I am winning. And yes, it's getting better, it's getting easier. And then there's another battle. And then there's another battle. And life is a constant battle. And you think you're winning. You think you're just getting over that. And yes, you're getting over that situation, but another situation is waiting for you. And when does it come to an end? Your life is just a battle, battle, battle. You are bound by battles. Jesus came to open up those doors, those prison doors that keeps you in that battle so we can be set free from this. Now, I'm not saying this. This is the word of God. Verse 2 says, Jesus came to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. Somebody should be screaming and shouting hallelujah right there. What does this mean? This means that Jesus came with the good news and that the time is coming 
where God will show his favor over you and over me, that struggle. And that God will pay back everybody that has done wrong to you. So listen to what I'm saying. God will pay back everybody. You, you don't have to do nothing. What does this mean? I don't have to try to punish you. I don't have to try to hurt you like you hurt me. I don't have to try to make you cry the way you made me cry. I don't have to take revenge. God will take revenge on my behalf. And if any of you know how God works, if I have to take revenge, just say, as for argument's sake, I'm fighting with, with evangelist Damien. My punch will be like a slap. But if God has to deal with it, God's breath is like fire alone. He will demolish everything that's on his way. God fights our battles. We do not have to fight. All God wants us to do is surrender. The problems are too big. It's too big. You cannot do it alone. You cannot. You were never meant to do it alone. You were never designed. We are not designed to do it alone. Problems. We all have problems. So this is why Jesus came. This is the appointment. This is the assignment. This is the anointment of Jesus Christ. To preach good tidings to the poor. To heal the brokenhearted. To proclaim liberty to the captives. Open the prison to those who are bound. For those who are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And the day of vengeance of our God. So that is why Jesus came. So Jesus has come to do all these wonderful things. But who, is he, who did he come to do it for? Look at the end of verse 2. The end of verse 2, it says, He came to do it, or he came to comfort all who mourns. He's a comforter. He came to comfort those that are in mourning. So who is, he do, who is he doing it for? He's doing it for those that are weeping, those that are crying, those that can't find a way out. For those who don't see any solution to their problem. He's here to comfort those that mourn. Now let's go down to, um, to, to verse 3, right? The beginning of verse 3. And it says, and this is very interesting, right? To console those who mourn, so the first part is he came to comfort those who mourn, and then it further goes on to say, to console those who mourn in Zion. I want to focus in on the word, of, the word Zion. What is Zion and where is Zion? Zion speaks of the city of David. Zion is where David set up his altar for God. Zion is where Solomon built his temple for the Lord. Zion represents the abiding place of where God is. When you see Zion in, in the scriptures, in the word of God, it symbolizes being in the perfect place, being in the perfect will of God, the place where God abides. Zion is a place of hope. Zion is a place of restoration. Zion is when you are walking in the perfect will of God for your life. Yeah. Now the, the word of God says to console those that are mourning in Zion. So if Zion is such a perfect place. Why is there mourning there? Why is there crying? Why is there problems in Zion? Why are the people mourning if they're walking in the perfect will of God? The church today, people will teach that all will be well, hunky-dory, all will be good as long as you are walking in God's perfect will. But I want to tell you that you can be walking in God's perfect will, but there will still be things that will make you cry. You can do everything right. You can be the best person anyone can be, but still there will be problems in your life. How do I know this? Job. He's the perfect example. He did everything right, but still he suffered. He was a good man, but still he lost everything. He prayed every day and he worshipped every day, but still he became sick. He did what was pleasing to God, but still he was sitting on the roadside with sores on him. 
Job was living in the perfect will of God, but still he had troubles. So if you're feeling sorry for yourself this morning, oh, I've got so much of issues and problems and nobody understands and I'm going through so much, stop it. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Stand up and dust yourself out and go to the word of God. So that was Job. Jesus also told his disciples, take the boat, go across. Jesus was sleeping there. And the storm came and all the disciples got afraid. Here the disciples listened to exactly what the Lord told them. But still, they came across the storm. The Lord was with them. But still, the storm came. Yes, church, you can be in the perfect will of God, but you will, you will experience problems. You can be in Zion and you can be broke. You can be in Zion and still have trouble in your marriage. You can be in Zion and still have um, children who makes you cry. You can be in, in a Zion and still encounter the giants of life. You can be in Zion and still be sick. You can be in Zion and still be lonely. You can be in Zion and still be disliked and hated. You can be in Zion and still get fired from your job. You can be in Zion and have someone sick in your family who you prayed for and still they died. You can be in Zion you can be walking in the perfect will of God, but you still will encounter problems. The word says that the people were crying in Zion. So, why were they crying? What are the reasons were they crying? What, what, why? What, what made them cry? Now I want to focus in on verse 3. It says, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes so there must have been ashes there if God wants to give them beauty for ashes they were crying everything must have been in ash so he's saying I will give you beautiful ashes so there must have been ashes we see ashes ashes are formed only after a fire has demolished everything to dust and that is how you get ashes ashes symbolizes loss and the people of Zion had lost everything and it was reduced to ash Ashes mean that you, you don't have anything left to prove to anybody of what you had. The only thing you have left are the memories. You had a good life. You had a good wife. You had a good job. You had a good family. But now you have nothing to show for it as everything is gone and everything is just a memory. So they were crying because all that they had was reduced to ashes. So that was number one. They were crying because everything was reduced to ashes. Okay. Then we read further down. Why were the people crying? To give them oil of joy for mourning. So they were in ashes. They were in mourning. What is mourning? Mourning is in fact not crying. Mourning is, is much deeper. It's worse than crying. Crying is the surface. Mourning is from the inside. Mourning is a state of your mind. Tears only last for a while, but mourning can last for years. One can mourn about all the things that was done to them and everything that they've lost. But one can also mourn out of remorse over the things we have done to other people. How many other people did you make cry? How many of us here are mourning because of what we've done to other people? How many of us here broke up other families because we couldn't keep our pants on? How many of us cause other people to take their own lives? <coughs> what have we done to others that we cannot undo? 
Your actions bring tears to your eyes, causing you to be in a state of mourning over the physical and emotional death you cause to others. The people of Zion were in a state of mourning. Were they mourning for themselves or mourning over what they've done to other people? The next point, the people of Zion were crying because, and I want to zone in, spirit of heaviness, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. So they had a spirit of heaviness. They were crying, they had a spirit of heaviness. The spirit of heaviness speaks of depression. They were depressed. The circumstances of life uh, has depressed them. Has your singleness depressed you? Have your children depressed you? Has your boss told you something and depressed you? Your lack of finances, has that depressed you? You walk around defeated, deflated. This is a spirit of heaviness. This is a spirit of depression. But today, church, I want to tell you that we thank God that when we read all these things, all these depressing things, he, God just does not leave you there. He just doesn't, there's no other book after that. But he, he does not leave us hanging, but he, he continues. But he continues with hope as to how we can overcome all these things. He gives us solutions to the problems. I read to you all the problems that we see. But let's go back. What were the solutions? The first problem was the ashes. God says, I gave them beauty for their ashes. When a forest burns down, you don't see any greenery anymore. You don't see any beautiful plants. You see nothing. You don't see the green color of the vegetation. You don't see the purple flowers. You don't see the yellow and green birds in the trees. All we see is devastation. There is nothing beautiful about it. Because it's only ashes. And that is why the word says, He will give you beauty for your ashes. How many of us have been living in destruction for far too long? How many of us have been living in a season of autumn and winter all our lives? I'm here to tell you that God can give you beauty for your ashes. For far too long, we are happy in the ashes. For far too long, we are just rejoicing in the ashes. But my God is just and righteous. And He will pick you up. And He will dust you off. And He will clean up the ashes. And He will wash you. And He will cleanse you. And He will apply perfume over you. And get rid of that smoky smell. He can make our lives beautiful again. He will give you beauty for ashes. Thank you, Jesus. So what was the solution for the morning? And as we read, to give them the oil of joy for their morning. So how many of us know what oil is? Oil is a lubricant. Oil helps to make things work smoothly without any friction. When there is motion on and, or where there is heat, friction is created. The oil lubricates the parts in motion, helping them to work smoothly together with no friction. When you... I experience this and I walk into the room and I close the door, and all of a sudden the door is squeaking. That's the friction that's making that noise. But the best remedy is you take some oil and you put it on the hinges and you wait for that oil. The oil will soak in, will go in between all the joints and the cracks or whatever is on that hinge. And after a while, the door works fine. No squeaking. It takes the squeakiness away. How many of us have been around squeaky people? They're always complaining and they've got nothing good to say. The sun is not hot enough. The moon is not bright enough. The breeze is not so breezy. The tea is too hot. The milk is too white. They just complain. They're squeaky. And what you feel like doing, you feel like taking them, Uncle John, and throwing them in the oil. They're just squeaky. Complaining. Squeaky. 
And this is the reason why we come to church. So that when we praise and when we worship, we can get some oil sprayed there. There's a little bit of oil being sprayed there. When you listen to the word of God, there's a little bit of oil being sprayed there. There's a little bit of oil coming down over you. It helps us to be content with what we have. Stop complaining. In fact, oil is very important. Might not be healthy. <laughs> Too much of anything is not good. Yeah. A little bit of oil is fine. Yes. I cook, I use oil. So what do we make? Guys, what do we make with oil? What, what can you do with oil? What, what foods can you make? What's the famous foods? Nicole, what's the famous foods we make with the oil? Fried chicken. Fried chicken, yes. Pork chops you can fry. Chops, so we make a nice uh, chops with the chili powder um, mixture, and you can fry that in the oil. Fat cook, you'll fry in the oil as well. You forgot about the, what about the fish and chips in the oil? So now, I want you to go home today. I want you to fry chicken. If you don't have chicken, come see me. So I want you to put that stove on. You put your pan on, on that stove. Don't put any oil and put the chicken there, let it fry. What's going to happen to that chicken? It's going to get stuck. It's going to get stuck to that pan. That's what happens when you don't have any oil. How many of us are stuck to what happened 10 years ago? How many of us are stuck because of what she did to me last year? How many of us are stuck because of what they said about you three years ago? That is why you need the oil. So you won't uh, get yeah. stuck. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I refuse to get stuck in the past. I got to move on uh, because everybody else have gone, uh, have moved on. And I got to move on. Uh, I can't afford to be left behind. That is why we need the oil. So we won't get stuck. Yes, Lord. Please thank you, Lord. How many of you guys like bacon and eggs? <laughs> now, there's something different about bacon. Do you need oil to fry bacon? Where does the oil come from? When you apply heat, the oil stored on the inside if you can get what I'm trying to tell you. Yes. When the heat gets applied, the oil from the inside automatically comes out. Yes. It activates itself. Can somebody get excited in this place? Because we all need to have this oil on the inside stored up so that when the heat is applied, when the troubles come, the oil can be activated automatically and be released. And maybe you can't come to church one day. No. And then you're facing this great problem. You got the oil inside already. And it will come out when the heat is activated. When the heat is up, the oil is going to be released. I have the oil of joy yes. and nothing can steal that uh, away from me. I got the oil of joy no matter how poor I might be. I got the oil of joy no matter, what, no matter what my boss tells me. I got the oil of joy no matter what the doctor might say. I got the oil of joy no matter what is happening in the economy. No matter what is happening in our country. I got the oil of joy inside of me. You need the oil of joy inside of you. We all need the oil of joy inside of us. Jesus name. Jesus came to give them the oil of joy for their mourning. You enjoying the word so far? Yes. Praise God. We continue reading. He came to give the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, for depression. A garment of praise. Now I've been around a whole lot of garments 
When you talk about garments, you talk about clothes. My whole life, Shana is in the clothing industry. I've seen garments is lying all over the place in my house, samples and whatnot. But if I take this suit out or this coat and leave it on my bed, and I'm standing and I say, suit, come. Come dress me. Is that suit going to listen to you? No. That garment does not listen to you. You can't order it. Come dress me up. That would have been excellent. Imagine how much of time you would have saved. Hey? How much of time you would have saved if that thing, the clothes can just dress you up on its own. But we need to take. Tell your neighbor, take. We need to take that garment and we've got to put it on. Tell your neighbor, put it on. You've got to put it on yourself. The garment of praise is not going to automatically dress itself on you. You have to decide in your heart to take this garment and dress up. The choice is yours. God does not force you to praise. Even though he's waiting for your praises, he's not going to force you. You can choose to complain or you can put on the garment of praise. You can choose to be, press, to be depressed or you can put on a garment of praise. You can choose to have a lemon juice face. How many people know lemon juice face people? I know a lot of lemon juice face people. You can choose to have a lemon juice face or you can put on a garment of praise. Say garment of praise like this. With a smile. Garment of praise. Garment of praise. You got to put on the garment of praise. And church, who cares what other people think? Yes. Don't worry that you are the only one raising your hand. Yeah. Don't worry if you're the only one that's singing the praises. Yeah. Don't worry if you're the only one that's shouting in joy because none of these people can give you access into heaven. None of these people died for you on the cross of Calvary. No one here saved the world from the everlasting death. No one here died and rose on the third day. And that is why, and that is why, and that is why we got to praise Him. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, you are worthy. Uh, why, but why do we have to, why do we have to go through these issues? Why do we have to go through these problems? How nice life would have been if we didn't have these issues and problems, eh? Nice. So why do we have to go through these problems? Why do you have to go through the ashes, go through the mourning, go through the depression? And as we read further down towards the end of verse 3, that they may be called trees of righteousness. Yes. Yes. God wants us to be trees of righteousness. Now we get a lot of people that think they are trees, but in fact they are just a bush. Yeah. Bush Christians. <laughs> Bushes and plants, they just get blown away by every wind of doctrine. Yes. Whichever way the wind blows, they will go. Yeah. What everybody else is doing, they will do. If everybody else is sad, they will be sad. If everyone else is depressed, they will be depressed. But trees, trees stand firm and it represents strength. The clouds will come, but the tree does not get scared of the cloud. The rain will come, but the tree still stands there in the same spot. The hailstones will come. It will fall on the tree. It will hit the tree, but the tree remains firm. The tree remains standing. It is strong because the tree has been through the test of time. It has been through all the good times. It has been through all the bad times. And it did not move. The tree has been qualified from being a plant or just a tree to now being a strong tree. If there's anyone here who has made it through some things in their lives, 
And who knows what I'm talking about? If you are still standing here this morning, you are still around. Uh, we're reading Psalm 37 verse 25. I have not seen the righteous forsaken. You will not be sick, forsaken, but you will stand uh, like a strong tree because you are righteous. Are you a righteous tree? Or are you a bush? Are you just a plant? Are we plants or are we bushes? Or are we that strong, righteous tree? The problems of our lives makes us strong. Without the problems, we cannot fathom how to get strong. You can go to whichever gym you want to go. You can push whatever you want to push. You will not get that inner strength. What's the use of having muscles on the outside when inside you're nothing? There's no muscles. No spiritual muscles. No emotional muscles. You will be called trees of righteousness. You go through the storms. You go through the problems. But I want you to realize if you are not dead, which means you are still standing. If you are not dead, which means you are still around. Which means you are still strong. Which means God has not finished with you. Which means you've got greater things for you. Righteous trees. So how do we become, how do we become righteous trees? The word says that they may be called righteous trees. Um, they may be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. I want to stop there. I want to focus on the planting of the Lord. This means to be a strong tree, you need to be planted where the Lord wants you to be planted, not where you would like to be planted. We don't want to be where God wants us to be, but we want to be in a place where everything is good. Yeah. When JCC was established, people asked, why are you guys planting the church in Mitchell's Plain? When you could have planted the church in a more favorable area, yeah. in a more affluent area. Was it uncomfortable to be in this area? Oh, most definitely it was. Did the gangs break in? into the church and steal the equipment? Oh yes, they did. Yeah. Did we see people running into the church full of stab wounds and blood? Yeah. Most definitely we did. Yeah. Did I have to drive 42 kilometers to and from church every Sunday? Yeah. And not for one service, but two services on a Sunday. No. Leaving out the other meetings we had during the week. Uh, oh yes, I did. Yeah. Was it uncomfortable? Oh, yes, it was. But we allowed ourselves to be the planting of the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's give God some praises there. When God plants you, it's never comfortable. It's never going to be easy. But God will not plant you in a place where he don't think you'll make it. If you don't think you'll make it, that's your problem. Because you're not looking at what God is seeing. God sees greater things for you. God sees bigger things for you. You might not see it. You might say, Lord, but I'm not familiar with this area. But Lord, um, um, there's so much of chaos. Lord, there's so much of violence. But God sees beyond uh, what we can see. And he will plant you. And you can choose. you got a choice. You can uproot yourself and go somewhere else. And when you do that, you will never survive. You know, most of the plants, when you uproot them, you can't plant them back again. Yeah. They, just, they just die. Yeah. We need to be planted where the Lord wants us to be and not where it feels most com comfortable for us. Yeah. My last point this morning is the reason why we go through all of this and the last sentence of the scriptures reads, that he may be glorified. What does this mean? So after all the troubles, after all the problems, after all the pain and, and the agony, God says it is for me to be glorified, for him to be glorified. Church, God will not share his glory with anybody else. He wants you to give him the glory only. He wants you to boast about what he has done. 
God puts us in a situation for longer periods of time. Because if he brings us out of it too soon, we might think we did it ourselves. God will put us in some impossible situations so that when you come out of it, you will say, to God be the glory, for there is no way that I could have come out of this myself. There is no way I could have done this on my own. No way. Church, we all have issues. We all have problems in our lives. And if you haven't got, you don't have any problems now going down the road in the future, most definitely you'll have problems. But let me tell you that God has a solution for all our problems. Jesus brought us hope. He came to heal the brokenhearted. He came to give freedom to the people who were held captive by habits of sin and habits and sin. He came to open up the doors of bondage so that we can be free. Jesus came with the good news of salvation. And he told us that the time is coming where God will show his favor and that God will pay back everybody who has done anything wrong to you.